today to talk about an example of Fourier analysis and one of the most uh, kind of important uh, kind of findings and application of Fourier analysis that has had a huge impact on how we kind of uh, basically view science, the world, biology, and uh, we'll get into that just a little bit today. So um, before we get into that, a very, you know, the kind of lead up to that, you know, huge discussion. One of the, you know, again, my background is material science, and I love or I've taught or and I've experienced a little bit uh, of uh, dealing with x-ray diffraction. So when we're analyzing the structure of materials, we know that we could use, uh, if we shoot an instant ray of uh, uh, radiation, it will kind of bounce off so you have an incoming ray of radiation. We have kind of these lines and arrays of atoms in metals. For polymers, you're going to see it's a little bit different. There's no long-range orientational or translational order. Sometimes, well, there's some degree, but um, no, not like metals. So if we have metals, metals are easy, polymers are hard. We shoot our electron ray. Our electrons behave. They have particle wave duality. We have basically the wavelength. It hits here, fracks off at certain angles, uh, theta. They're detected by our detector here. And from these kind of diffracted rays, we can measure this kind of interplanar distance. The, yeah, basically the spacing between these planes of atoms, and we can do something about the structure there. So um, Bragg, basically, he won this uh, with his father, uh, the the Nobel Prize when he was 25. So get to it. There's not many more years left for you to <laughs> win your Nobel Prize. Anyways, that's probably never going to happen again. But um, also, quick side note, um, my one of my advisors, not my advisors, but one of my um, lab professors at MIT was um, – his name, he was actually a, uh, basically a student of Bragg. So Professor Lynn Hobbs, so he is a real expert in X-ray diffraction. Um, I'm just a poor imitation. But anyways, um, we can essentially relate, um, based on this Bragg diffraction, this distance to these kind of, uh, you basically uh, uh, create a plot like this. This, inner, uh, this intensity that's detected by this detector here as a function of two theta, because again, there's this kind of two theta relationship between where your detector is measuring. Anyways. It doesn't really matter because effectively what we're doing here is we're looking at this plot and we are going to deduce this um, from this relationship here. This is a plot of what? How is theta related to D, our interplanar distance? Proportionally or inversely? It's an inverse relationship. So what we're plotting here in this graph is effect effectively, it's a Fourier spectrum. We're looking at reciprocal space. So kind of very similar kind of idea that's utilized uh, for X-ray diffraction in order to kind of measure these different properties. So for large two theta values here, if or my theta values are very, 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 very small, I know that I'm measuring what type of distances? Large distances or small distances? So if theta is small, that means what? I'm looking at what type of distances? Let's actually write it out here. So if theta is small, I'm looking at huge distances. If I'm looking at large two theta values, I'm looking at, so this is, DHKL is very, very, very low. Here, my DHKL is very large. So, is this, again, inverse, you know, we looked at inverse time, that was frequency. Here, we're looking at this two theta, which is basically, uh, effectively, this inverse uh, kind of space. Uh, reciprocal space is what, you know, it's typically called. So, uh, this is what we're saying here. Typical case. And we could use XRD to look uh, and examine kind of uh, at the differences in structure and see kind of when things change. So one of my favorite examples is looking at a polymer. So polymers aren't going to have this kind of um, intensity versus two theta where we just have spikes. We're going to have uh, basically more broad kind of peaks here. Again, this due to polymers are, you know, kind of this, you know, you can look at my MEC202 videos. Polymers are kind of like spaghetti. So there's no long range orientational order. There is some short, there is short range order in polymers. So, you know, CH2 has to be next to here, but um, your polymer is just essentially a spaghetti. Uh, it's a spaghetti mess. Uh, and so you're gonna have some fluctuations and no long range orientational order, um, or at least not to the extent that metals occur. So anyways, let's look at these methacrylate polymers. So the only thing they vary is the length of this R chain. So at the end of this R is this methyl group. So CH3. Except for here is obviously CH2. But anyways, that's the only difference between these three polymers. It's just the length of the side chain. Now, if I put all those four polymers, and if I put them in an XRD, I get the following curve here. So this was for my, again, my shortest, and then my PMMA, and this is my longest one as well. So let's look at what's happening here. 
So I'm getting some peaks here and here. So these peaks don't really seem to be changing in terms of two theta for all my polymers. They actually seem um, to line up uh, exactly here. Uh, so these, these distances or these peaks, these two theta values are not changing. But here, uh, I'm getting kind of these curves are shifting. They're moving around. Uh, and you can see here, like this first peak is kind of shifting. Here's another peak here. And there's the other peak right here. So it's almost like these peaks are moving to the left here. So why could that be happening? So there's some peaks that aren't moving, and there's some peaks that are shifting and uh, basically moving to the left. Well, let's look at the structure of our polymer and what distances, again, this plot is telling us where we see peaks in 2 theta are telling us about distances. So at these large values of 2 theta, which correspond to what type of distance? Because we know that distance is oops, THKL is proportional to my theta inverse minus one. So this is effectively our relationship. So this is this inverse relationship. So let's look at the structure of our polymers. So if I'm looking, this is just for PMMA. So I know that this length is what's increasing here. So there are certain distances here that are conserved. So this distance will not change depending on the length of this uh, molecule. Also, this distance, the intersegmental distance, will not change as a function of my R or how many you know, methyl groups I have. But this distance will definitely change. This will get larger. Uh, and this distance will change as well. So we have some distances that are very short that aren't changing. So let's go back to, uh, actually, let's go to my presentation. Here we go. Brag, all this good stuff. So large values of 2 theta correspond to small distances. And these peaks are not changing in terms of 2 theta. They're not shifting at all. So that makes sense because those distances aren't changing depending on my R length of my methacrylate series. Which I don't have that here. Uh, so, but there's these other distances, these longer distances that are changing. In fact, they're increasing. So what's happening here? So as my R group gets longer, so like there's four R groups here, as I get longer and longer and longer, so short, longer, longer, huge, I'm seeing some of these peaks split and shift to the left. So again, as I go smaller in 2 theta, as 2 theta decreases, I know that what? DHKL increases. So we can kind of, again, deduce something about this polymer structure by looking at this, again, this inverse space, this 2 theta, you know, intensity versus 2 theta curve that we've been kind of examining here. Um, so this is the power of Fourier analysis. Uh, so we can look at this intensity versus 2 theta plot, look at where we see peaks, look at where peaks are shifting, and correlate that back to, again, some uh, characteristic structure or distance in our materials. So that is our power of our Fourier analysis, and we're going to, in, uh, actually, in the next video, we're going to discuss, uh, actually, the tragic um, kind of tale of Rosalind Franklin. Not tragic, I mean, she's received credit, a little bit of credit now, but still a sad story, but, um, and the importance of why we need to know Fourier analysis for our careers. So, uh, thanks, and I will talk to you all next time. Uh, see you a little bit later. Bye.